Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. And we're going to open with a brief word of prayer. So please kneel with me. Dear gracious, loving God, the God of the universe, we bow humbly before you this morning on the Sabbath day that you created for us. And we want to appreciate all that you have done in giving us the Sabbath and giving us fellowship with you and with one another. And we ask that your presence may be with us, guiding and directing our discussion and me as I facilitate. And we just thank you for the lines, the unfolding present truth, and that you guide and direct in our understanding of it. Be with us now, in Jesus' name, amen. And I'll just see if I can yes, let's do it that way. Uh, well, <laughs> it is uh, a, another Sabbath, and it's eight days past the start of a development uh, in Israel that we're all aware of. And I had intended to do my part two of the previous study that I was working on, but I just felt impressed, <laughs> more or less, at the 11th hour, unfortunately, but, uh, and it was a busy week, but to unpack a little more together, perhaps, to do with this conflict that is going on. And as we're in the agitation of the Sunday law, I felt it expedient that we particularly me, maybe, <laughs> come to understand the situation, some of the background, just how it fits in to the prophetic narrative and uh, with Islam. And and just, uh, as I say, I am uh, ignorant of a lot and uh, want to learn more. So we're going to use this as a, as a little bit of a a learning time for all of us. I'll, I'll definitely facilitate, not as organized as what I would like to be. And therefore, it may jump around a little bit, hopefully not too much. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll share together and just see where we go. First thing I want to get started with is we know that we ended up... Um, being led to make a change and we could maybe put it in terms of a mindset spectrum i'm going to label it versus a political spectrum but both <laughs> are applicable but in the center, being centrist. And uh, I, I'm going to say right. I'm not sure if it displays on the correct right side of the screen or not for you, but <laughs> I'll trust that it is right and left. And we want to go beyond that and label what we've come to know a little bit, certainly in the politics of the U.S., uh, as the speakership was vacated, Kevin McCarthy not willing to run, <laughs> probably knew he would, wouldn't uh, be voted in anyway. It took 15 rounds the first time for him to actually win the speakership in the first place. But the far right has, has definitely been influencing uh, the GOP in more recent time, uh, more and more so. And uh, so as well, we're going to 
put in the far left. And recently there have been varying comments made and different things posted on the WhatsApp uh, group. And I've been following some of it as I've had time and uh, am able to. And, and I just want to, for myself, as much as for any of the, the, the rest of you, I want to just throw out a caveat, a warning, a cautionary, in that, as Elder Tess has let us know uh, previously in Vespers and, and, and various studies, it, it's part of the danger is, uh, number one, <laughs> not making the shift from right to left, right being for our purposes, conservative Seventh-day Adventism, uh, and not making the shift from that over leftwards, over to the left, where we would label it as progressive, light is progressive, constantly unfolding, and we need to be aware of how we read uh, particularly those two things, as we um, investigate line upon line and uh, the prophetic narrative as it unfolds on our, our timelines, particularly the, the line of the 144,000. And so that's one danger, not making the shift in the first place. And the other danger would be for us particularly, I'm referencing now. The other danger would be going too far. So danger number one, danger number two. Not making the shift initially, secondarily, uh, making a shift too far left and consequently ending up where God would not have us be. And the Israeli um, war, because Benjamin Net Netanyahu, uh, the day after it began on the October, began on October 7th, Sabbath morning for us, but uh, October 8th, he, he pronounced it as we are at war. And the conflict, as we've come to understand even for prophecy, we realize that simple is often what we have understood previously, Daniel, Daniel 11. Uh, but there's a complexity as well. And so we have to move from the simple to the complex in our understanding. But again, not fall into two ditches, I think it was Tamina, with some of her studies where she she drew that, you know, ditch, ditch on the one side, and we could say simple, and simple, that saith the Lord, over on the right, right? It, it's straightforward, it's spirit of prophecy, read it just as it is, literal and so on. But over on, on the other side, there is a ditch as well, which is also, it makes it look simple. And it's very enticing. It, it's very, very um, inviting to, in a sense, stay comfortable in, in one ditch or get comfortable again in the other ditch because we gravitate to the simple. Complexity is challenging it takes time and effort and <laughs> everything to to unpack but where god would have us is understanding the complex as he helps us to do that very thing and in a sense that's sort of not that i intended to line it up or anything but you know that centrist position that is left but not too far left so and um, so I'm going to, well, I didn't take time to do it a, a moment back. This is, I was setting this up, but I'm going to mention where it is that we are 
on our prophetic line, as we know, we're approaching the, with air quotes, Sunday law. The, our understanding still still the symbol. We definitely use the, the um, Sunday law applies. And we're in, still in the agitation of the Sunday law. So some of these events that are unfolding externally are still um, part of the agitation, the internal agitation, uh, as well as within the church, <laughs> within our movement, as well as external agitation, some of the current events as they unfold. And we can go into a lot of different things, but I want to just limit it to this one, the study of Israel and Palestine in a little bit more depth. Uh, as I say, hopefully not too scattered around, but at the same time, uh, I'll lean on some of you and, and for God to help us all as we all grapple with understanding how we should be seeing this event. And I know uh, Penny Smith was in the WhatsApp group voicing some of the thoughts that I'd had um, as well. And she put it into the chat very well. But in essence, sort of, this is a harbinger of what will yet come. We know Islam is is in the picture, in the narrative, uh, prophetic narrative, and therefore us understanding some of these things, particularly, as I say, for that that caveat, that warning, where we're to be in, in this, um, in, as we uh, assess what is going on, not too far left. And I'm going to uh, read something. Forgive me as I Oh, no, pardon me, that's uh, not what I want. This is what I want. And I might have to, I will share share screen just so that you can see it a little wee bit. What I'm, I'm going to have us go to for the first moment is uh, something that I ended up uh, having crossed my path. And it's... I'll just explain. It's a group of lawyers, mainly in the UK, uh, that, well, as it says, lawyers for Palestinian human rights. And we know that we're, as radical feminists, um, we are, are very interested in human rights. Uh, the atrocities, the oppression happening in various uh, locations around the world, we're aware that it is exactly that. Uh, uh, blight on human rights and freedom, freedom of individuals, but most importantly, equality, equality for all, which is what God upholds and what his character is all about. And so as a consequence, we have a, a high regard for, for uh, a high regard for human rights. Anyway, I just want to read a little wee bit. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's a page in a bit, but as lawyers committed to the protection and advancement of Palestinian human rights, we call upon the international community to act decisively to immediately cease the ca catastrophic resumption of hostilities in Israel and Gaza. Previous large-scale hostilities between Israel's military forces and Palestinian armed groups have caused massive loss to civilian life and destruction to civilian infrastructure, predominantly in Gaza. We have no confidence that the parties to this conflict will properly adhere to key international humanitarian law principles 
that govern the conduct of hostilities, distinguishing between civilian and military targets, proportionality, we can use the word scalability, but proportionality and precautions in attack based on our assessment of previous escalations. And this, I'll just note, has been written October 10th, three days after Hamas um, sent over 300 plus missiles into Israel and breached the the uh, wall, the border border uh, in Gaza there. LPHR, Lawyers for Palestinian Human Rights, acutely deplores the acts of Palestinian armed groups, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, to kill and abduct hundreds of Israelis and to indiscriminately launch thousands of rockets into Israel. As of October 10th of October, it is reported that at least 900, it's now up to over 2,000, Israelis have been killed and at least 2,600, whatever, injured since October 7th. More than 150, it's at, and may even have gone up from that, but Israelis confirmed now have been abducted and are being held captive in Gaza. And of course, we know that, that uh, Hamas issued sort of midweek uh, issued a statement that they were going to be killing off hostages uh, if Israel didn't stop its um, bombing and and uh, unannounced, particularly surprise bombing was sort of how they worded it, I think, in that. Anyway, the uh, LPHR is also acutely appalled by Israel's military response to deliberately target scores of civilian homes in Gaza. And we'll just skip down that part. Israel's immediate military response demonstrates that it is again implementing its extremely controversial military policy of deliberately targeting, targeting family homes in Gaza. The execution of this policy was viewed by local human rights organizations as the emblematic feature of Israel's military offensive in Gaza in 2014. The subsequent UN Independent Commissions of Inquiry quoted a witness who said, This war, 2014, was different from previous wars, especially for women. Civilians were attacked, particularly in their homes. The home is the domain of the woman. And then it goes into some other stats. Uh, Israel's legal justification for its deliberate military targeting of family homes in Gaza is that a home can be lawfully targeted on the basis of operating as a command and control center. However, very significant questions have been raised by the UN Independent Commission of Inquiry and by LPHR as to whether Israel's authorization of airstrikes against family homes are in compliance with international humanitarian law. And I'm going to shop, stop rather screen share there. It does go on a little bit more, but um, the, well, I guess that closed it out. Sorry, just a second. There we go. Okay. Um, So there are two streams of information, <laughs> nothing new to uh, any of us. And to my understanding, the best I've been able to unpack all the way through uh, since the back history, sort of back, decades back, uh, began, and I'm not taking it as far back as biblical times at this point, although I will make one comment perhaps, but uh, the narratives presented have been flavored by worldview. And consequently, there are two 180-degree diametrically opposed 
uh, narratives. And as a consequence, we want to be careful we don't sort of get swept up into the wrong stream of information. And just coming back to the whiteboard for a moment, this, this, this left versus right. And by no means have I solved who everyone is, who all the players are and what their, their mindset totally is. But we'll, we'll take a look at, at a few things and, and you may have some other comments and so on to lean in on. Uh, the narrative that is, in a sense, left-leaning, as I was just reading with the, the letter from the, the lawyer's uh, body, uh, and this is what's happening in, in a lot of ju different jurisdictions, is looking at the humanitarian crisis. Uh, Netanyahu uh, shut down all you know, water, food supply uh, lines, uh, electricity, um, starvation is happening. Uh, you know, all sorts of things are happening just this morning. Well, actually, it was yesterday, late yesterday, our time, but but given a, um, it, it was announced by Israel that there would be a six hour window of safety for people escaping from Gaza City and he heading south, getting out of out of uh, the region while it's safe to do so for their own safety, kind of an announcement. And uh, some of the news reporters who have been stationed in the region sort of questioning as they spoke to IDF, Israel Defense Forces, uh, personnel, whether, you know, leader, well, mainly it is leaders, generals, you know, whoever, uh, that they are asking, well, how pervasive has the word gotten out? You know, there's no internet. <laughs> Those people no longer have electricity. So are you, you know, putting pamphlets down from the air and making sure everybody, you know, in all languages and, oh, yes, yes, no, we definitely are. Everybody's aware of exactly what's going on there. They, they've had warning. They know was sort of the answer. So the, uh, and I'll just go to the map quickly for a moment. Hopefully you can, you can see it just to put it into the record a little bit, what, what areas and so on we're dealing with. Uh, the, okay, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Israel, areas mainly um, inhabited by, by the smaller Jewish population that does live there, but Palestinians live everywhere, as do all, you know, people from all every international region and so on. I mean, a lot of people live in, in Israel and uh, that are not necessarily Jewish or that are not necessarily Israeli. Uh, but the areas in particular that are being spoken of, Gaza Strip, and it it, in the history, it was an area that Israel basically pushed Palestinians into, I'll just use a simple, simple language, but pushed Palestinians into, and even as some of the people uh, reporting on the whole situation over this past week have commented, I mean, it's a, the Gaza Strip is a very densely populated area there's at one point at the beginning of this were about two million people living in this small little area of uh, armistice 1950 there's an armistice line that was settled upon and so it's basically the area between the sea and and the, the border that was set up you know with, I'm not sure wire fence checkpoints 
that, that kind of a thing. Uh, and, but densely, densely populated, you know, very narrow streets and, and, and uh, close houses, businesses, everything is, is very concentrated, as you can only imagine, into a small geographic region. And Hamas, over the years, uh, has built underground bunkers, underground tunnels. They store uh, much of their military uh, hardware there and bring it up onto the surface, however, whatever way and so on. And, uh, you know, fire missiles and do whatever, and then take it back underneath. And that's where they believe uh, the hostages that have been taken, around 150, give or take, uh, possibly more, uh, are being hidden. And Israel, over many decades, has tried to destroy those underground tunnels and ended up not really ever succeeding. And so the other area that is what we would possibly label, you know, pa uh, Palestinian, you know, more Palestinians, uh, the West Bank area, and just to give you a point of reference, you won't be able to read it on your, your screen, but Jerusalem, right there, Tel Aviv, right there, and then the, the Golan Heights, Dead Sea, the Tiberias, Golan Heights, um, and it's Israeli occupied, uh, but at the same time, you know, it, over decades it ha has had its whole history of contention and, and uh, war. And Lebanon is where, of course, Hezbollah uh, is in support of Hamas. And, uh, well, we'll get to some of the history. Uh, the Red Sea down here in the Mediterranean Sea. Anyway, just to give you a, a little bit of um, point of reference. And it it's interesting. Oh, I keep bringing up the internet and I don't want that. Sorry about that. Um, it's interesting that the... Let me just go back to we're we're conversant with the terms like nationalism, freedom over equality versus equality over freedom and, and the nationalistic right-leaning um, right side is uh, nationalistic and values freedom over equality. So it will trump equality and, and put equality on the back burner and isolationism. And, but at the same time, the far left as well has a, uh, let me just minimize this for a second. The, the far left as well has a, a world view as well. Does, is anyone wanting to weigh in as what as to what you think the far left world view is? I mean, separate to Israel in a sense at, at this moment, just anything anyone want to weigh in in terms of what mindset, in a sense, resides more on the on the far left? It's a thought question. So do weigh in. I can pick on anybody. But <laughs> it's nice to see a, a good group here. And I don't like picking on somebody in a sense. Go ahead. Hey, David. Um, oh, sorry. Uh Tell you what, Tabo, we'll let Katya weigh in first and then you will yes, uh, that's fine. over to you. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Katya. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tabo. Thank you. Hi, Debbie. Uh, I have not read so Hi. much about the far left so far. 
Uh, but I know that their, um, sorry for the noise, I know that their ideology is uh, linked to imperialism. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think that they will see uh, this um, conflict as a way for Israel to, uh, to, to, um, to obtain part of the land, you know, as an imperialist ideology. Okay, Katya. Uh, it's interesting because, and I'm glad you have said what you've said, and Tabo, you can, can weigh in uh, in a moment. I was just going to suggest how I had seen it, and I, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> how I had seen it is more that the far left has supported the Palestinian uh, right to self-determination and to have their own state and and be equal, be able to be equal. Um, and so what you're letting me see is I maybe had it flipped in terms of that they would more support Israel. Um you're probably right. I as I said, you know, I have not read so much so far. But I know that the idea the idea behind that is imperialism. Uh, but I'm probably that's wrong. True. Yes, I'm probably well, wrong. and that's you know, Katya, to be honest, that's why I sort of picked this topic because I know I'm I'm very ignorant. I want to, you know, un unpack more in terms of how is the correct way for us uh, to be seen these different developments and and as obviously over time it, a lot more is going to unfold this isn't going to go away quickly um and anyway i'll let tebo you go ahead and weigh in and just add to the mix what you were uh, thinking um well when you look at how the I, I guess the left views the israel palestine issue um they do support um you know the 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 equality and right to self-determination of the Palestinian people. I think when you look at the left worldview, it 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 uh, it's a worldview that is um, it is cognizant of, uh, sensitive to, recognizes you know uh, the problems of colonialism and the crimes that have come through uh, colonialism and imperialism. And when you look at the modern state of Israel, it, it's really a European colonial project, right? It came about uh, following the uh, Balfour Declaration, right, by Britain. Yes. Uh, which was done without without any sort of consultational mind to the uh, population that was already in that land, which right. So, uh, so the the left the the left's worldview would sort of emphasize that and sort of emphasize the sort of uh, state-led human rights abuses, right? Um, it, it would look at, uh, I, I guess, the, the declaration of the UN Special Rapporteur, which points to the fact that, um, the statement of the UN Special Rapporteur, which points to the fact that uh, essentially the Israeli state is keeping Palestinians in conditions that amount to apartheid. Right. And, and there's a whole history behind that, you know, um, I think in Goldstone Report and so on. So the, the left it, it is generally supportive of, Pal of, Pal of, the, of Palestinians and critical of Israel and Israel's actions in that situation. Thank you, Tebo. And, and that's it. The uh, Lord Bal Balfour's. Uh, 1917 declaration and he was um seeing no problem with anything that was written in and and bringing the king's name into it in support of you know britain supports uh a a, a jewish holy land being established and uh the Balfour Declaration, of course, ended up 
um, feeding the very crisis because the conflict just almost naturally in a sense was going to end, end up erupting and it did and uh the the you know as you suggested britain has been implicated in in helping to produce i guess if i could use that word helping to produce the whole crisis situation that has existed over time and the white settler imperialist colonial um worldview uh, was very much at the core of uh, some of what ended up unfolding. And then you add to it the, uh, I mean, sometimes anti-Semitism is what it's it's labeled as, but in essence, it, it may possibly not really be anti-Semitic, but instead, um, I'll just say anti Zionism or anti Zionist, and and that's it. Zionism is sort of a uh, more extreme part of. Um, right-leaning Israel thought, Israeli thought, and it uh, is very much about having the Jews be able to return to a homeland. And it was interesting, a little bit of the reading that I did, <laughs> fairly contracted period of time, fairly, fairly brief period of time uh, yesterday, but uh, they actually discussed, because a lot of Jews, you know, after World War II uh, and the Nazi Holocaust and just different developments, Russian pogroms and, and different things that Jews ha had experienced, you know, the, the ones in Europe had sort of determined, you know, that uh, this isn't going to change. We're, we're still going to be the the um, receiver on the receiving end of uh, anti-Semitic sentiments. And so we need to, you know, we, we aren't really going to have peace until we have our own our own nation. And so that was it was giving an impetus to it, and I'll get into a little bit of that history in a moment. But but as a result, they they discussed a little bit where <laughs> where because a, a lot of Jews had had um, left for America for other places uh, around the world, and. Uh, and Palestine was the geographic location that they picked. And then they had to, in a sense, sort of promote it and, and, and uh, 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 um, garner support, in other words, amongst the Jewish community and, and be able to sell it. That, uh, and, and so there was a resurgence of Judaism uh, amongst Jews, you know their own their own cultural and religious heritage, and you know uh, raising pride and and you know just some of the other things that come along with that nationalism, nationalistic viewpoint, and at the same time it was interesting because through much of the the period as this is happening, there was a resurgence within Christianity uh, in a, a lot of different denominations, in a sense, if you like, uh, in terms of Judaism. And there were denominations that went back to looking at the Old Testament and the 
feasts, the annual, the annual Sabbaths, and uh, many ended up becoming feast keepers because they just liked the idea and the, the whole thing, not necessarily fully understanding it all, not necessarily like, like we de- did within our Adventism, uh, where we knew in terms of, of the uh, sanctuary services and, and the, the feasts and so on, and Christ coming was a different dispensation and and uh, so on. Anyway, I, I will look at a little bit of the history because I do want to bring that into the... Uh, As you go into that, David, I just want to add, you know, there's an yes. interesting oddity to sort of speak to the, I, I, I guess, the colonial nature of, of how the modern state of Israel came about. You, you mentioned that there was there was even talk of, you know, Okay, so Europe is not gonna get easier for the for, for Jewish people. Maybe we maybe could find somewhere somewhere for them to go, right? And in that discussion that took place, there was something called the Uganda scheme. Um, there was talk, serious talk, uh, you know, presented, you know, at a um, I think it was nineteen oh three. It's called the Sixth World Zionist Congress. There was serious talk of essentially carving out a portion of Uganda in East Africa and uh, giving that to to uh, uh, to the Jewish people. And of course, you know, uh, just as what happened uh, with Palestine, eventually the local people there would have had absolutely no say in, you know, in, 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 in how that, in, in how that, uh, in how that would have transpired. So it's just, I just thought to to put that in, you know, that uh, they did look around and they did throw around different places that, you know, um, that they could hand off. And, anyway. That is very fascinating, Tabo. And, and I want to highlight again another remark that you had made in terms of the South African apartheid example gave a lot of impetus to... Uh, the desire for a Palestinian state uh, of their own, or pardon me, a, a Jewish state of their own. And, and uh, in, in a sense, as I was saying, the two streams of information, the two narratives, it's interesting how victimhood surfaces on, on both sides, Israeli, Palestinian, both sides and and it's this determining of wherein uh, greater right sits or 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 just how it's going to be used um, in the unfolding of prophecy going forward because atrocities have occurred on both sides. Uh, something I read yesterday was was sort of indicating that the atrocities that Hamas has done over this week of time are nothing in comparison and this of course is that is that more well what I had come to think of as more the, the far far left uh, mindset anti-imperialism anti-colonialism whereby the uh, atrocities done by the Palestinians uh, were nothing in comparison to the atrocities that Israel has perpetrated against the Palestinian people over all the eons of time. And as often happens with different, um, whether conspiracy theories or sometimes false claims, even sometimes there's a there's a part of truth, you know, in, in essence, as I was pointing out with the, the, the lawyer's letter at the beginning, the humanitarian crisis, you know, we, we definitely, we can agree with, with aspects of, um, you know, what, what's going on, that there are, are real atrocities and serious uh, things that are happening that, that shouldn't be happening. Even uh, President Joe Biden in the course of the week, and Anthony Blinken, 
uh, I believe, uh, I'm not sure if it was yesterday, it might have been Thursday, but sort of weighing in and cautioning Israel, uh, Benjamin Net Netanyahu, uh, that, you know, operating by the rule of law and, and we're going to exercise restraint and because uh, Israel has pretty much um, taken a, a fairly hardline uh, position that no restraint, we're going to destroy Hamas. It needs to wipe, be wiped from the face of the earth kind of attitude. And of course, Hamas has dug its heels in and uh, has stated that Israel has to be destroyed. That, that's our goal, destroying Israel. And as many reporters and even people online just weighing in, you know, hatred, hatred doesn't solve anything. Uh, for me, it was interesting. Um, some of you may be familiar with a, a singer from decades back uh, by the name, he, he went by the name of Cat Stevens. Uh, and uh, one of his most famous songs, actually, was uh, Morning Has Broken. But he ended up converting to Islam uh, years back, decades back. And I just ended up seeing something that he had posted, and it was all to do with this peace, peace, and no hatred, and, and love. And, and we know that day is coming. It's called heaven and the new earth, right? But at any rate, uh, the um, some of the history has been, and Tabo, you mentioned, made mention of, um, let me just get to some of my little bit more dates and stuff. Um, and uh, switch. Um, and actually, sorry, before I move on, <laughs> I'm going to unpack a little more about that, that Balfour uh, Declaration of 2017. I'll just read a little wee bit um, and quote Lord Balfour himself, uh, just to give you a bit of flavor of, of sort of what was going on. Jewish settlement in Ottoman, Ottoman Palestine, also known as Southern Syria, which is something I hadn't known began in the 1880s, but it was November 1917 that marked the crucial turning point. The British Foreign Secretary of the time, Lord Arthur James Balfour, issued what became known as the Balfour Declaration, which stated that, and so this is quoting it, His Majesty's government view with favor, view with favor, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Well, it was a far cry from that. And continuing on, this historic promise effectively meant that Zionism would be underwritten by British imperial power. London, pursuing its own geostrategic plans of dividing the Ottoman Empire up with Paris, took Jerusalem the following December. Three years, 1918, three years later, mandatory Palestine was established by the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, putting the British government in a position to keep its word to the Zionist leadership. From this point onwards, Jewish immigration to and colonization of Palestine could proceed apace under British rule. European Jews did not choose to move to the Middle East voluntarily. They were driven there by anti-Semitism. And as I said, even stretching up to World War II and the, the Nazi uh, hatred of, of the Jews and the Holocaust and so on. Uh, let me see if I want to read this. No. Okay. 
and actually, I, I, I want to, there are, um, actually I'll just minimize that so I can see what I'm <laughs> looking at. The, uh, there are a couple of different, different um, views of how to end the conflict in um, Israel and with, with Palestine, with the Palestinians. And one is this concept of two people, one land, in which uh, coexistence basically would be the, the end result. And it's interesting, uh, I became aware of um, a, a group, and I won't butcher it, and actually I wouldn't even remember it at this point, the, the um, proper name, but it, it, it's sort of known as, in the English, Oasis of Peace. And there is a community there in Israel uh, and I believe it was situated geographically, not not too far, a bit north of Jerusalem. I, I might stand corrected on that. But uh, and Muslims, Jews, and Christians, all dwelling together in the same community. Uh, I'm not sure if it started out in the as a, like as a commune, because I believe it's been there since the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, in other words, children attending schools together, uh, activities, community things uh, happening, and uh, where religion doesn't necessarily even come up, in, in a sense. And in more recent days, uh, some living there ha have sort of said, you know, this is the model. It's possible. And uh, it would it would need a, a change in worldview, perhaps, and also a change in the level of uh, hatred and the entrenched positions and so on that are held on both sides of the situation. Uh, anyway, that was kind of an interesting little little uh, bit of information. But um, I'm going to highlight now, uh, 19, 1947 was a pivotal year in a sense. Um, and, and I'll just read a little further, uh, forgive me, but... Before 1947, Jewish colonization of Palestine, Palestine proceeded primarily through land purchases, expropriations, absentee landlords selling the land, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and it, it obviously not violent, at least for the most part, let's say less violent. And, uh, but, it, but it's interesting because uh, one comment that uh, sort of got coined at the time is two peoples cannot both be a majority on the same piece of land and in in many cases uh the position taken on those who are are pro-palestinian and a palestinian state being established often will point out that the jews are in the minority now, over time, uh, since the 40s, more and more Jews did end up emigrating to Israel. And in some cases, they had never been to Israel before, <laughs> but they supported this idea of uh, an Israel Israeli homeland. And um, anyway... In 19, uh, uh, well, but the 1940s saw the violence come to a head. On, on the 29th of November, 1947, the United Nations, which only consisted of 57 countries at that uh, point in time, passed a partition resolution accepted reluctantly by the settlers 
the Jewish, uh, and totally rejected, understandably, by the natives, the Palestinians. And this partition divided the territory between Jews and Arabs. This produced bitter fighting between the two communities, which ended, in the words of the, uh, well, I'll leave off that. Uh, and then, as a result, this November 27th, um, 1947, the partition and it was, as Tepo alluded to earlier in his, his comments in terms of, whoops, uh, in terms of the Palestinians being asked or the Palestinians being involved in the process or any of that. I should really have worded this, the partition of Palestine. You get the, the understanding, the Palestine partition, uh, 1947. So November 29th, 1947. And Basically, what happened is oops, the surrounding, uh, mainly Arab um, countries, ended up coming into the area to fight. So Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, they got support, Palestinians in uh the Gaza and, and West Bank area in the Golan Heights got the support of the surrounding uh, Arab uh, population, military population. And as a consequence, a six day war erupted. And it was, let me just, okay, this was a war of independence for the small population of Jewish refugees fleeing European anti-Semitism and the gas chamber. And it ended up being a catastrophe for the uh, Palestinian population because the, the um, Israeli military, not sure if at that point it was referenced as the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, I, I don't think... But, Already, they had become very, very powerful. Tanks, you know, a lot of, lot of equipment. And uh, as a re result, they, and, and it, 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 they also had a militia in Palestine, the Palestinians, it was mainly civilians, they, they, you know, that they were um, fighting back just as, as civilians, throwing rocks, you know, that kind of a thing. Anyway, um, and they, um, the result, I'll, I'll just say that the result ended up being that Israel gained territory and they came away in, in a sense, triumphant. And some would put it that they, uh, gloated that there was a, a racist element as well This this white settler uh, pride and so on surfacing and they ended up um, just ecstatic at the result of what the six day war had led to and and even just saying you know we took care of them in six days you know it was just basically well, some view it as ethnic cleansing but uh, in some cases almost uh, total annihilation, but I just wanted to read one other thing because there was a shift. Let me just... Oh, that's right. I added my own oh, story. <laughs> okay. There was a shift from viewing Zion on the left. There was a shift from viewing Zionism and Palestinian nationalism 
as the products of circumstances over which neither of them had control. In other words, it just worked out. Jews fleeing anti-Semitism and gas chambers and that circumstance and them fleeing to Palestine. Uh, and then as a result, the Palestinians being uh, suddenly moved in on and, and basically told, this isn't yours anymore. Um, so some on the left viewed it that, that it's just circumstances prior to this. It's just circumstances. Nobody's at fault. Nobody's to blame. It just ended up being circumstances that unfolded and it just unfolded the way it had to. And, and there really isn't anything that could have been done about it. So people on the left shifted from that kind of view of things and to the position held more uh, hardline today that Zionism as a as a malign force that has brought ruin to the Middle East. So they lay the blame totally uh, with Israel and that Israel has destroyed the Middle East and any hope for peace and, and all that kind of thing. Anyway, the United Nations was um, brought into being, I mean, it morphed from the League of Nations, as I mentioned earlier, to the um, uh, from the League of Nations to the United Nations, and uh, it uh, it ended up um, endorsing the right of Israel to a, a Jewish state, and that's it. In 1948, Israel was proclaimed uh, a Jewish state, which is interesting because we've had, uh, you know, Tamina brought it out with uh, quite a few of her studies and so on, the whole view of theocracy and, you know, a religious state. I mean, in, in some cases, um, many Israelis do view themselves as a, as a religious state. And we know that that isn't... Um, isn't accurate. The other thing I want to just highlight for a moment is BDS. And I believe it was Elena in the uh, WhatsApp chat that ended up uh, making a comment in response to somebody else uh, on this. And I just want to read it. It stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And this is a strategy that has been employed uh, by the Palestinians. And again, I'm just going to read a little wee bit. Uh, it's a Palestinian-led movement for freedom, justice, and equality. Uh, upholds the simple principle that Palestinians are entitled to the same rights as the rest of humanity. I mean, on the surface, it all, it, in many cases, echoes things that we would, we would, uh, possibly potentially agree with. Israel is occupying and colonizing Palestinian land, discriminating. This is written from a Palestinian viewpoint, as is obvious, but I just wanted to clarify that. Palestinian land, discriminating, discriminating against Palestinian citizens of Israel and denying Palestinian refugees the right to return to their homes. Inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, the BDS call urges action to pressure Israel to comply with international law. BDS is now a vibrant global movement made up of unions, academic associations, churches, and grassroots movements across the world, which is why there's so many protests that are happening on the side of Palestinians and on the side of uh, the Jews uh, throughout the earth. Since its launch in 2005, B BDS is having a major impact as a, and is effectively challenging international support for Israeli apartheid and settler colonization. 
and then they, they uh, zero in on some of the ongoing injustice. Uh, and I'll just briefly say, you know, it, I mean, I was earlier talking about land being expropriated, land being taken over, but there there have been all sorts of things that have happened uh, by Israel towards the Palestinians and uh, shutting down universities and schools, uh, although the, the Palestinians did develop their own university system. And and that's it. That created sort of reaction as well. And because there ended up becoming a, uh, as often happens, a younger generation of Palestinians that were more activist oriented and more, um, uh, well, against Israel, more vocal about it, but also willing to to become more violent and Hamas when it won its election uh well I think won two elections I maybe have that incorrect certainly has won the one election uh it, it has just grown in popularity and, and much as Israel has tried to stamp it out even before in the past uh to, past prior to 2023 uh the populism the popular mindset is is there and the and the numbers just keep swelling in a sense uh, Hamas numbers and it is the more um I'll say militarized but it's the more um radical side of and that's in let me bring up my screen again that's in uh, like particularly Gaza City and and the Gaza Strip, Hamas is situated. But at the same time, the West Bank, uh, what is it, Fatah, Fatah Palestinian um, party, I guess you could say, or group, uh, bears more sway in the West Bank area. But at the same time, there there are uh, Hamas has representation there as well, but. The Palestinian Authority, uh, 1947, things were, were set up, but there have been different permeations of, of things over time. And the Palestinian Author Authority uh, was wanting more to work with the West and, and bring about a peace in Israel. Yasser Arafat, the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, um, did end up uh well meeting with clinton meeting with different world leaders and so on and as hamas and ended up um interpreting things as not enough is being done it, it's not moving fast enough and it's not it's not going the direction we wanted uh palestinian state and and not so much the idea of this this two people one nation kind of concept although i think hamas at times definitely was supporting that and they would agree with ceasefires and they would honor them and hold true to them and so on but the um boycott uh, divestment sanctions strategy has had a, had 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 uh, some effect, but likewise, the Israeli iron arm um, has has used some of those same strategies in reverse. And I'll just comment that the what was the word <laughs> I used the word oh proportionality I, I made it akin to scalability. It's not quite, but proportionality, and that's been one of the biggest complaints by the Palestinians over time surfacing again this past week uh Israel responds way out of proportion that has been one of the bigger complaints from the Palestinians and and that's it Hamas now has you know not only a mass 
their number of millions or um, number of weapons. I believe at the beginning, they actually had put the word out that they had over 100,000 missiles. And uh, anyway, uh, Hamas, is, Hamas has increased in power, increased in, in, uh, in a sense, popularity, has increased their technical uh, expertise. And so at this point, they pretty much have dug in for the long haul, bring about their ends. Anyway, there was one other thing. Oh, yes, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Three goals. And I'm just quickly going to refer to those. Ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall. And number two, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality. And number three, respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. And I'll just read that part. Since its violent establishment in 1948, Israel's establishment in 1948, through the ethnic cleansing of more than half of the indigenous population of Palestine, Israel has set out to control as much land and uproot as many Palestinians as it can. As a result of this systemic or systematic forced displacement, there are now more than 7.25 million Palestinian refugees. They are denied their right to return to their homes simply because they are not Jewish. And it certainly is true that um, there is Tel Aviv, for example. Actually, it's a hyphenated word, Tel Aviv, but it also is hyphenated with a third word added. And the word is Yafo, Yafo. And I've seen it spelt with two Fs. But anyway, right along, right along the Med Mediterranean Sea coastline. And evidently, very, very developed, very modern, very, you know, the, the um, I'll say city of Yafo. And what ended up happening was that uh, Israel basically bombed it and flattened it, raised it. And I mean, they had theaters, they had schools, it was a cultural center, it was a, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a thriving Palestinian city. And Tel Aviv was built on the ruins of Yafo. So that's why it's Tel Aviv, Yafo, in some cases, on maps or whatever. So there certainly have been atrocities done on both sides. The United Nations and the USA have definitely supported Israel. Uh, and the oppression that is occurring throughout the earth, there are a lot of different regimes, you know, uh, where abject oppression is occurring against a, a people group. And Israel is getting over, I was astounded when I heard this, uh, over, I, I think it's $1.3 billion in aid from the USA a year. And that's been going on for years and it equates to, I'm not quite sure, but I'll say 40 to 50 million, uh, well, dollars a day. One, one reporter had pegged it at. I haven't fact checked, so <laughs> don't, hold, don't hold me to it. But uh, anyway, the, uh, the other allies of the U.S., Turkey, Egypt, uh, Jordan, the Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Qatar has been, Qatar actually, has been uh, 
trying to negotiate and, and see if there isn't something that can solve the, uh, at least bring about a ceasefire, the, uh, what's been happening there. But it's, uh, the U.S. is, in a sense, in a position where they're, you know, Biden has made it clear. They're hundred percent going to support Israel, and it it is viewed by the remainder of the world as a democracy and so on. But at the same time, Benjamin Netanyahu is um, well. I'm going to go to it because I'm pretty much I'm going to end pretty soon. Um, he actually he, he was in the Israeli military. One of the the um, extreme groups i'll say sort of akin to the seals the you know the navy seals or or some of these specialty units and uh and initially as, as he gained power and, and got in in uh, ruling israel uh and he's been the longest uh tenured prime minister he, he did lose at one point and that's it Originally, as a younger individual, he fully 100% supported uh, Palestinians having a state, that it needed to work out that Palestine would have its own state, uh, separate to Israel. And, and, you know, but it, it ended up not being popular. And so at one point he ended up losing the election. He had been in power already, but and maybe even two terms worth. I, I can't quite remember the timing of when it was that he lost, but he was ousted. And before he ran again and won again, uh, he changed his, his uh, more moderate mindset to one of hardline and that's what he holds to today and we know that he definitely is more very definitely right-leaning and uh, some cases with what he's been doing more recently in terms of the Israeli judiciary and truncating their power and so on he's probably definitely moving more and more far right but uh, Anyway, I, I have more notes and, and different things, but you know what? I, I don't want to appear too scattered and just be jumping all around too, too much. Oh, I know what I was going to do. Probably we'll finish off with that. It was a bit of a, a timeline. And I just wanted to... Let me just stand up for the whiteboard again. Hopefully you can see, uh, you can see it. Well enough, or clearly enough, I know it's not super clear, but I just wanted to uh, highlight a, a little bit. Forgive me, I have to bend over a wee bit. But uh, I mean, 1989, uh, 2001, uh, Sunday Law, a close of probation, uh, Second Advent, you know, our, our, our way marks. And 1991, uh, some of the shifts that happened with uh, George W. Bush or George H. W. Bush uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, 1989. Anyway, I wanted to bring out uh, what was it? The 1831 to 1841 is. And I had totally forgotten about it and haven't fully unpacked all that I need to review and uh, end up uh, reacquainting myself with some of the history. But it's a uh, the 10 year span is actually a proxy war. And it's 
Turkey and Egypt. Turkey and Egypt. Over Syria. And it, it's interesting because the, uh, as we know, the in years 2011 to 2021 also has been a proxy war and it's king of the north king of the south And as well over Syria. As they say, I won't say too too much about that because I do have to re review. <laughs> There's so much, so much, uh, so much needing reviewing, at least in, in my case. <laughs> but you know, some of these developments, as we are in the agitation of the, the Sunday law, and we see our our the Millerite. Uh, history dates there in the red and realize some of the unfolding of the external events uh, right now in our time. It is, um, it behooves us to make certain that we've made an entire shift but have not gone too far because as Elder Test did bring out, the far right and the far left are not correct positions to be in either side. And even uh, as Tamina had brought out, there is a, a, a ditch both on the right and on the left that we could yet fall into but that we need to uh, be teachable and be very much reading things correctly, ensuring that we're in the right stream of information and perceiving, uh, in some cases, even the hidden, hidden uh, treasure, the, the hidden information, using the parable methodology to uh, unpack and make certain that the, the lines are what are um, guiding us. And uh, by God's grace, we'll stay on the path. Anyway, I am going to end there. I hope it wasn't too scattered. <laughs> and uh, it, as I say, said at the beginning, I didn't have to take lots of time. Uh, Switching in midstream sometimes isn't, isn't the best thing, but when time is of the essence, sometimes it's... And, and this was a topic, as I say, I wanted to do more reading myself and, and more studying, and will yet do, but I wanted to at least share a few things. So I'll close with prayer, and then we'll, we'll open things up for some further discussion after the, the closing hymn. So let's kneel for prayer. Dear God of heaven and earth, we thank you for giving us brains and for creating us in your image that we know you are willing to help us as we grapple with understanding things that are happening externally in the world, even as they unfold. We want to see things correctly with your eyes and to understand how everything fits together like pieces of a puzzle or like the, the thread going through those eyes of the needle uh, at each way mark and, and tying things together. Uh, we just 
ask that you'll continue to guide and direct us in for each of us in our own studies. And we pray for our leaders, for Elder Parminder, for Elder Tess. We just ask that you'll watch over both of them and keep them both safe and and helping us as we grow and progress heavenward that that they as well will will be able to be healed, be able to continue to guide and direct as they have done so faithfully for so long now. Be with each of us as a new week enters uh, later on, and we just ask that you'll continue to give us wisdom as we interact with others, family members, and those in our, in our individual spheres of influence. We're in serious days, and we want to have the truth as it, in Je as it is in Jesus be the thing that guides and directs us. In his name we pray, amen.